dear loyal First Issue Club listeners and first-time downloaders, lube up your ears, because we're about to put another episode of First Issue Club right in your brain. As always, we're a weekly comic book podcast where we discuss new comics each week, so you can have a reading club, or decide what to spend your allowance on. (laughs) <laughs> this week we're covering first issues that came out on Wednesday, January the 24th. We're going to be covering Raven, number one on mm. DC. Mm-hmm. Vinegar Teeth, out on Dark Horse. Yes. And finally, Abbott, number one on Boom. Let's drink to Caitlin not being here, sadly. Caitlin, in your memory. In your memory. Cool, cool. I miss you, baby. The cat is away, the mice will play. We are going to (laughs) be off the rails today, folks, because we have no uh, help keeping things in line. Mm -hmm. Uh, Launch the question. All right, so the question of the day is, we cover a book in this episode called Vinegar Teeth. The creature gets his name because of a trait he has, and that's a a scent. So he gets the nickname Vinegar Teeth because he smells terrible. So the question I'm going to pose to uh, to the club members... Uh, today is if you were to get a nickname from a trait or a little personality quirk that you had, uh, what would that nickname be? And uh, tell everybody who who you are. What who's in the club today? Um, this is Budget King. So outside of Budget King, my nickname might be Two Panties. Mm-hmm. Um, I normally wear two pairs of underwear, uh, one for support. And then one that's like a briefs in case somebody de- depenses me in public. <laughs> <laughs> so you just have like a backup. Yeah, well, one's kind of like banana-y, like, mm-hmm. it, like jockstrappy. Mm-hmm. And then the other one's like the pants defense. So I'd be two panties. All right, this is Greg Lichtai. And if I was to have a nickname based off a personality trait of mine, it would probably be Pizza Lips. <laughs> Do tell. Uh, well... <laughs> I am constantly eating pizza all the time, and so I've never tasted my own lips, but I'm almost certain that they taste of marinara. Do you think in a reverse world, pizza would eat you? That It's like my nightmare. That's my HP Lovecraft nightmare. <laughs> the thing that I love the most. <laughs> eating you. Tries to kill me. Hi, I'm Michael DeStacy. Um, my nickname would be Full Feelings. Because I always put them fully on display. I'm not good at hiding them. If I don't like somebody, I feel like it's painfully obvious. And if I do, I love them so much. All right. Let's get this (laughs) podcast started. (laughs) This episode's going to be 10 minutes long. We're going to get kicked off Fountain City Frequencies <laughs> for this one. <laughs> Let's get this podcast started. <laughs> Our first book is Abbott Out on Boom by Saladin Ahmed and Sami Kavila. Set in 1972, Detroit. And the subtitle of this book, when you turn it in, is City on the Edge. And that's what we've got here. In 1972, Detroit, it was a city um, on the edge, also experiencing a uh, white flight. And so um, Elena Abbott is uh, a one-lady show uh, reporter who's reporting for uh, a Detroit newspaper where she's covering all of... Um, basically all, all crimes from the lens of uh, true justice. She's recently exposed a pr- police brutality issue of which white people in the city of Detroit are none too pleased with her reporting. Coupled with this story is a bit of a par- paranormal activity. Her love of her life was uh, possessed or taken away or killed by some type of paranormal activity and she has repressed that and is dealing with that uh, by not dealing with that and just doing uh, the best fucking job she can as being a reporter. But that fear will rear its ugly head in her uh, life now as she's investigating crimes where there are similarities to how her lover was killed. Um, And that 
is the story that we run into. A reporter in Detroit investigating paranormal activities. We got a mashup, boys. What? Uh, yeah. Um, um, a mashup. <laughs> what did you think about the mashup? Two different things. Historical uh, novel dealing with a bunch of stuff and uh, paranormal noir going on. How'd this mashup work for you? I didn't realize that the paranormal stuff was literally happening. Me either. Like, she was having a hard time and she was, like, tripping on about it. Now, it seemed more like a historical, like, uh, book about Detroit and race and um, white flight and kind of how it was to be a black reporter back in the 70s, which is a good comic idea on its own. Totally. I love that aspect of it. Yeah. Because she's, she's, she enters herself into some pretty, like, nasty... Um, scenes where she's like in crime scenes and seeing just like grotesque grotesque stuff and i take it that it's not a normal part of her job right that she's become photographer and journalist so she's having to go to the scene of the crime and i thought these things were just like triggering her i think they were but it's triggering but it's triggering her past experiences not necessarily triggering like delusions right whoa Honestly, that layer of reading it, when I when you say it like that, I'm kind of like, you're totally right. Because she steps in to see the crime scene where she's recently mm-hmm. having to take f- uh, photos because of a budget, quote-unquote, budget uh, issue. Yeah. Which is basically, they're just trying to force her out of being a reporter because she's being she's writing, reporting on too many black things. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a really interesting way to read this comic book. Which is another reason why I just, I loved this comic book. Yeah. I, I thought it was like, I, I don't love history stuff, but like, I do like the 70s and I do like, like race stuff and mm-hmm. like all of that. And there's even a layer of like Black Panthers that we might see yeah. in this. And that's like my jam on history. And then the the paranormal or not thing is, was it was actually what sealed the deal for me on loving this book. Did you, after reading this, feel like you smelt like nicotine? <laughs> No. I get what you're saying. Do tell. There is hardly a scene she's in where she's not, not lighting it up. Yeah. And smoke. She smokes literally, she chain smokes through the entire mm-hmm. uh, book. Such is the life of a beat journalist in the 70s. It's the I'm good led, old days. I'm led to believe. Yeah. Uh, I normally, like, don't, that kind of would gross me out a little bit, but it seemed uh, to add this level of noir mm-hmm. to it in some way. And like it was almost like her nervous tick was like smoking, and to me that illustration like mechanic worked. I've never seen it work so well. To be honest, I'll say that. Hmm. I, there was a true dedication to making her smoke more in this comic book than I've ever seen any comic make a character smoke. Yeah, <laughs> we she, all we all knew that guy in college who was just like partying all day and then like having to work all night and was constantly just, like, up smoking totally. all the time. She's literally carrying, representing the black story in a newspaper in the 1970s on her shoulders Yeah, while trying to be forced out, while um, her bosses almost call her the N-word mm-hmm. in, in the same room with her. Uh, she has every right to be smoking, chain-smoking. Yeah, she's dealing with a lot of shit. Yeah. What's mm-hmm. awesome about this comic book is it's dealing with like the nuances of it like she goes to a seemingly black diner um or it is a black diner sorry but there's i don't know that like they're dealing with segregation but people but black people have like normal jobs it's not just straight like no black people here or not it's it's in this cusp Mm -hmm. of like transition for racial stuff and it really is about like white flight in neighborhoods and stuff so it's like honestly it's such a it, this is what I imagine happened, and I don't know. And this author is, like, super decorated as an author, I think. Um, he came up with this cool story about a journalist that's dealing with stuff, and he picked this time frame, and then he was like, wait a minute, the time frame that I picked is actually cooler than the story <laughs> that I had previously <laughs> written, so I'm going to deep dive on that time period. Oh, yeah, I got to go back to that story. And it made a perfect comic. All right, boys and girls, now we have 
Raven, Daughter of Darkness from DC Universe. Mark Wolfman was the writer and Pop Mahan was the artist. Raven, Daughter of the Darkness follows uh, ra- the uh, character Raven, most commonly known from the Teen Titans. She is a teenager and we are following her journey as she is living with a new family. Uh, she's living with her aunt and uncle and she's trying to kind of forge out a new normal life. She has some new teen friends and they like to hang out on the beach and they like to talk about all their heavy troubles. Uh, While they're on the beach, she kind of divulges the info that she herself was an orphan and that her mother was in a cult and that she was born while her mother was still in the uh, cult. The kids, while not being the normal response of, that is fucked up, but please tell us more, (laughs) uh, seem to um, accept her and don't really give her much grief, which is nice of them because I would not have done that. Yeah, you guys aren't getting that courtesy from me if I get your cult reveal. Oh my god, I would be... Leaving yeah. that beach party pretty quick. Right, yeah. In fact, just <laughs> don't even be my friend anymore. Just go away if you were raised in a cult. Um. <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm just kidding. I have, I have acceptance of everybody's beliefs. Right. Thank I have many you. friends who are That's all cults. I wanted to hear. Okay. So basically in this story, we have um, two stories going on, which is Raven trying to acclimate to this new normal life she quote-unquote wants. And we also have this... Uh, other story of this uh, complex that is holding this certain uh, human, metahuman that has powers that has escaped. Uh, so we get this um, kind of interweaving stories of this uh, complex trying to uh, recapture this uh, metahuman that has fleed from the scene. And um, Raven has, we've come to find out, a special connection with this human because whenever she is injured, uh, Raven can sense it or feel it. So whenever uh, she does get hurt, Raven kind of transports to the area where she's being chased down by these kind of Jurassic Park-looking dudes. What's that human called? Uh, Azra? No, that that human that the title of the mini. Oh, Anime Eyes. The ti- the human's called Anime Eyes. Yeah, this is. <laughs> this book has like four subtitles, which it's I love. So funny. Yeah, Raven. Daughter of Darkness, the girl with the anime eyes under the hood. Part, part one, <laughs> under the hood. There's a goddamn. For a 12 part series. Yeah. Yeah. For, okay, so let's do the math. Four names for one comic, and there's 12 of them. So, how many names are we going to get? I'm glad they stuck with anime eyes, though. Yeah, that's pretty funny. That is cool. Uh, anyway, so we find, come to find out that Anime Eyes has the ability to put out into, uh, basically kind of mess with your perception and how you see things. She can create imagery that really isn't there, like earthquakes or monsters, to kind of uh, get her escape so she can kind of run away and not be captured. Um, she uses this on Raven. She kind of uh, projects that she is uh, Trigon, which Trigon is Raven's demon father, uh, if you didn't know, Raven is half demon because her dad is Trigon, who is full demon, and her mom is human. Also, father to the <laughs> demon we have in this podcast. <laughs> Spoiler! <laughs> we got a celebrity on the crew. Uh, <laughs> I liked it, and and I wanted to like it. So I'm so who knows? Maybe that's a. I wish Caitlin was here. She would tell me my psychological expectations and needs and wants there. I literally had to crawl up into Greg's lap and have him explain to me what was going on <laughs> panel by panel. <laughs> and even I was confused. So in that moment, I knew what a parent was because you're just making shit up on the fly. And boy, are you going to be a great dad. <laughs> oh, thanks. So my only knowledge of Raven is from the uh, Cartoon Network Teen Titans show where they're, uh, they're shrunk a little bit. Yes. Squished. Um, squished, squished down. Yeah, squished down a little bit. Um not really knowing her powers though, just I just aesthetically she is the coolest looking superhero. I can I can actually say that. Yeah, she's like goth. She's pretty she's pretty goth. Did mm-hmm. you guys see that I drew fan art of Raven on our Instagram? <laughs> I did see that. I liked it. That was awesome. You think so? Yeah. Uh one of our followers commented, L O L, nice. Uh I love that. <laughs> <laughs> it looked great. Your shading was super cool. Thank too, you. How you did it? It was and really like, cool. Oh. Really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. There's a character in here. <laughs> Uh, he's kind of like um, the the ancient one. He kind of knows the the timelines oh, and the yeah. past and the future. I can't believe you briefed over this guy. I know because I hated him. But his name is Baron Winters. Mm. At least it's not Baron Children or like. A- <laughs> 
<laughs> barren it's cupboards. Cool. I, 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 I am barren. <laughs> I just thought, what, I a, am, what a his funny first play on words. I am. <laughs> I am Baron. Yeah, Baron Winter. What a f- funny name. And he talks to a cheetah who does not talk back to him. But uh, a little. I think they communicate telepathically. Because you could tell that he's c- reacting to like a conversation. And therein lies my critique of this book. <laughs> <laughs> there is no visual cues for what is happening. Uh, let me run them down. Yeah. The cornucopia of these things. Man talks to Cheetah. Apparently Cheetah's telepathically talking to him back. We don't know. Raven can teleport into other people. No visual cues. Uh, Raven is, uh, sometimes becomes a, a giant ass, like, Raven, mm-hmm. I guess. A little bit of visual cues, but not a ton. Oh, uh, anime eyes turns into other shit. And we don't know. It's like seemingly this. This was written as if it was a movie script, mm-hmm. and forgot a little bit of. Uh, this comic relies heavily on you knowing who the character of Raven is. If DC's having a problem selling this comic, they should pay Greg to come and read this alongside with somebody, and they will like it. Yeah, like a tutor. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's funny that so Raven is has lived in in, in another dimension mm-hmm. and she's raised in this cult which is technically a religion a cult's kind of a religion yeah but when her new aunt and uncle who she's living with they're very religious they talk about going to church and prayer groups and christmas or whatever she kind of takes this air of like disbelief like oh like a religion like what are you talking about? You've been living in a cult. Like, I just... The hypocrisy there is Do you just... think she just got dropped directly into, like, a 4chan uh, thing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, do not believe in God. She was raised by neckbeards. hmm <laughs> That's her <laughs> cult. That is a really good point. I wouldn't be much help uh, in her life as a 16-year-old except for explaining to her concepts like, oh, Santa Claus... Yeah, that's such a fucked up scene. <laughs> Who's Santa Claus? You don't know who Santa Claus is? And even trying to, like, combat that, like being a devil's advocate. Just like, oh, well, maybe people from other... No. No. He's everywhere. He's on food products. He's on commercials. Yeah. If she's, like, putting on clothes, talking, feeding herself, you know who Santa Claus is. Yeah. Okay, is she metal or is she emo? I assume she's emo. Yeah, she's emo for sure, I think. That belt, though? She's so sensitive. She's into, like, um, like the Blood Brothers. No. I could see that. I could yeah. see Blood Brothers. She's into, like, fashion-y, like, like kind of like spaz metal. No, you're projecting that onto her, because that's what turns you on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, this just took a turn. <laughs> oh, all right. I was accepting that. I would love to I would love to date somebody who was birthed <laughs> from a demon. Color me that. <laughs> Next up, we've got Vinegar Teeth number one from Dark Horse Comics, Art and Words by Gentry and Nixie. When when would you guys say this book takes place even? I am bad at timelines or time periods. This is my first like identifier for like what this book is, is like the time period, because it's definitely of a time period. There's pilgrim hats, yet there's <laughs> yeah. cars. Eye patches. Yeah. Uh, I'd say 40s. Yeah, I feel like it's somewhat 20s feeling, but also, like, 60s hipster, too. So we're going to settle on the 40s as a nice medium. We, we, we should find to see what piece of, what's the highest thing of technology they have in here. And it looks to be a car. Yep. Yeah. A boat. I mean, when did Sheriff start <laughs> stop dressing in these insane hats? Did they ever dress in these crazy hats? He's wearing, like, a Mountie hat. I'm getting us off track quick. It's a pilgrim hat. It's Yeah, it is a pilgrim hat. You're right. In any case, there's this detective who's going undercover to kind of bust this crime syndicate. And he's about to bust these guys he's been following for a long time. And this giant, pussy-looking blob of a monster pops out of nowhere and, like, ruins the bust. 
And this guy passes out, comes to later, and everybody's celebrating this gross pus monster for, like, helping bust these criminals. And the mayor gives this monster a medal and <laughs> yeah. ultimately become, ends up being this, like, cop's partner. And it turns into, like, a fun buddy cop from there. And this other cop's, this cop's, like, trying to ditch this monster constantly. And ends, the monster ends up just being, like, super helpful consistently. Yeah, he's, like, the nicest guy. And super endearing. <laughs> yeah, very endearing. He's, like, such a sweetheart. I loved that that's where this book went. Like, I had no idea where this was going, obviously. I don't think anyone would. Mm-hmm. But the fact that this monster ended up to be a sweetheart and everybody was like, yeah, let's give him a medal and, like, make him part of the police force. Like, so zany. Escalated quickly. Yeah, it did. And this monster, like, I I think they went to the drawing board and they said, uh, looks like an organ. Organ it up a little bit. Like, it, yeah. it looks like a walking, like, liver or esophagus. Uh, Can we make his insides outsides? Totally. (laughs) Yeah, it's like a pupa organ thing. It kind of looks like a maggot or something. Yeah, exactly. Uh, That's perfect. And uh, it is just Buddy Cop. It's a lethal weapon. It's um, What's another Buddy Cop movie you guys like? What's the one with Chris Rock and... uh... I've never seen a movie. Oh, how about... um, (laughs) What's the one with Jackie Chan and Chris Rock? Yeah. Rush Hour and um, Lethal Weapon... And uh, Jingle All the Way. Uh, yep, that's another buddy cop movie. Um, this, like, all the other right. <laughs> now we can move on, I think. We've named all the buddy cop movies. You're welcome, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So one thing that I, I heard about this book um, leading up to it, and I can kind of see it in this, is that it's Lovecraftian in inspiration. Um a lot of things are coming out lately that claim H.P. Lovecraft as an inspiration. What's, what's your guys' take? Without saying my opinion yet, I'll tell you why that is. Yeah. His stuff is so old that it's fair use, so it doesn't cost people money to have that association uh-huh. which, which uh, people like. His uh, brand of writing is called Cosmic Horror. Yeah. He also wrote uh, this thing called the Nep- Necromonicon. Yep, I've heard of this. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it'll actually be a uh, a device in like movies. Like mm-hmm. people will reference it because he wrote it as if it were a thing yeah. um, that actually existed. That like tells the story of, you know, Cthulhu and these demons and all of these other things. It I think in concept, H.P. Lovecraft is really cool. Every time I've tried to read something of it, it's lost on me. I need pictures. I got to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we do this podcast. <laughs> I've only read H.P. Lovecraft inspired things. So I can only gleam kind of what it might be based on that fact. Yeah. Uh, Greg, your thoughts on Lovecraftian things? I hate them. I don't like them because, uh, well, they're it's oversaturated right now. It seems like a, a, an easy plot device that people use in comics, board games, what, whatever, TVs, movies. It's just like, and I, I've also tried to read some of his stuff, and I think it's boring. It, I think his execution is not great <laughs> as a writer. That's just my opinion. I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me on that. I do not care. I do not what, like what him. What is that? Oh, it seems like something that maybe a steampunk might be into. Yeah. All of that being said, we deep dove on that. Yeah. Read this comic because it's fun and fun and zany. Yeah, it was so crazy. And I, and frankly, it doesn't need that layer of Lovecraft. They have a Mm-mm. they have a giant walking liver with pil- <laughs> pilgrim hat sheriff man solving the zombie plight of Brick City. Uh, what a name. <laughs> what a name for a town. Yeah. Brick City. Fuck yeah. Vinegar Teeth gets his name how? He reeks. He smells terribly. And they ask him, they ask this creature what his name is, and he goes, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Just born literally yesterday. I have right. no idea. What yep. is a name? <laughs> name, you say? Yeah. Y- you know one thing about this book that um, 
makes me a little bit upset. It is, or not upset, is it? I, it just makes me upset for my own self in life. Is it has that Aladdin physics principle? How his hat always stays on his head no matter what crazy antics or food he's stealing. Mm-hmm. The characters in this book are doing lots of crazy things, and their their hats are always staying on their head. Yep. Um, I wish we had that in life. Yeah, that was one of my favorite things about this book. It's <laughs> <laughs> how the, the hats stay on, guys. Yeah, cut that, dude. I thought the, that was really... The physics of it all. I thought that was cool. Oh, can I just say one more thing about this book and yeah. have it randomly inserted somewhere? It doesn't make sense in the other conversation. Yeah, you can. They show Vinegar Teeth being born, and he's one of several tiny embryos. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, you're right. That come out of this like waste pipe. Um, so am I to, led to believe that there's going to be several more vinegar teeth running around the city, and will they be good or will they be bad? Uh, I was under the impression that the rest of the embryos attached to those zombie characters at the end of the book. Oh, like somehow vinegar teeth escaped out of. Uh, Infecting people. This podcast should be God renamed Greg it. Explains Comics. Greg, <laughs> you're, to you're people named Mike. fucking mutant power, man. <laughs> Every time you you can read comics like the best of them. Well, fucking thank you. nerd. Well, thank you. Thank you. All righty, guys. This has been another beautiful episode of First Issue Club. If you have any thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, ideas, or anything for us, hit us up on social media, on Twitter, at F-I-R-S-T, First Issue Club. A lot of people hit us up last week telling us different things, and I loved hearing from them. I can't hear from people enough talking to us. It is so uh, We are so thankful that you listen to this podcast, and we do not take that for granted. Truly, truly. Um. Pod, or, uh, comic books saved my life, and I hope they save yours, too, if you're in need of saving. Otherwise, I hope they just comfort you to the, your abyss of a life. Um, <laughs> that's a generic audience statement. Too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else you want to say on the end before we get to our closing? Um, like uh, Budget King said, you guys gave a lot of recommendations. We really love that because uh, we don't want to cover books that you don't want to listen to. So if you have any more recommendations, find us on Twitter, First Issue Club, F-I-R-S-T. And I want to let our listeners know that every so often, very rad creators send us first issues of their comics to check out. And last week, we got two really cool books sent to our inbox, both with amazing titles. There was a fun book uh, that was kind of a kid's adventure comic called Space Cops, Serial Zombies, Mm. about eating cereal, turning kids into zombies. Hell yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And then there was another one. It was a real banger called Alien Toilet Monsters, which I can't even find the words to describe <laughs> what this comic book was. But it was insane. And um, Is it all ages or is it like Looking teen? forward to more of it. No. A- Alien Toilet Monsters is not an all ages comic <laughs> in case you were wait wondering. Yeah. I'm um, excited for that. Yeah. So check out these self-publishing badasses. It's really cool that they're doing this stuff. Support comic makers. Both of these people are on Instagram if you want to go look at their stuff. At Space Cops, spelled with a Z. And then at Alien Toilet Monsters. Um, just search that one. Don't worry about your search history. Uh, and the, the fan art for Alien Toilet Monsters is just amazing <laughs> and worth it alone. Hell They've yeah. got like toys and stuff. It's so cool. I really? Think, yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk about... This com- we have to talk about yeah. that comic on this podcast uh, sooner or later. Yeah. Since we're doing promos for other things, I want to promote two other things. Yeah. Um, the I want I want to tell our listeners about two other podcasts that they should check out if they like this podcast. Um, one is on Fountain City Frequency. It is What's in a Game. Um, Cody has been on the special Thanksgiving episode. Cody and Dana. Sorry. Uh, let me let, let me replace that. Cody and Dana have been on the special Thanksgiving episode uh, of this show, and you should check out their stuff. They're doing crazy awesome stuff. They just got back from PAX and yeah. released uh, three back-to-back episodes of their adventures. There. Very cool. There's another podcast called I Would Stab You by my friend uh, Alec. He does an annual podcast where he reviews the movie Groundhog Day and releases it on Groundhog Day. What? Isn't that a fucking brilliant concept? That's one of my favorite movies. That's funny. Then this 
podcast is for you. I cannot wait to listen to that. So, yeah, check it out. It is annually going to come, the second episode there, and I, <laughs> I wholeheartedly endorse that podcast. So he, he only does one podcast a year? A fucking year. One year. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant. Yep. First Issue Club podcast is a proud member of the Fountain City Frequency of Podcasts. We are recorded in KCR Studios, and our theme music is by Pry, Mary, Color, Music. It's that time again, guys. All right. Uh, I'm a I'm a dangerous man with pocket in my money. Oh, sorry, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a money man with danger in my pocket. Sorry, I'm a I'm a main I'm a maniac with danger in my pocket. Watch out. <laughs> was that your Was that it? You, That's okay. it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is Greg Lichai signing off. Sometimes I feel like I could just fall asleep and just stay asleep and just fade away. Just fucking fade away. Just fucking fade away. Just fucking fade away. Just fucking fade away. Oh my god. Oh, roll that beautiful bean footage, Greg. Bye.